Hello, this is UCL Uncovering Politics, and this week we're looking at a new way of thinking about the role of the state in our society, the idea of the precautionary state. What is it? What are its implications? And is it a good thing? Hello, my name is Alan Rennick, and welcome to UCL Uncovering Politics, the podcast of the School of Public Policy and Department of Political Science at University College London. At a time of breakdown in our public health service, unaffordable childcare bills and a cost of living crisis, questions over how our society should be governed and what the state should provide are pressing. Meanwhile, the response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the vulnerabilities in the energy and food supply chains exposed by the war in Ukraine reveal some think state failure to plan ahead and make provision just in case. One person who's thought long and hard about the proper functions of the state is Albert Weil, Emeritus Professor of Political Theory and Public Policy here in the UCL Department of Political Science. Long-standing listeners to UCL Uncovering Politics may remember an episode we did with him a couple of years ago on his major book, Modern Social Contract Theory, which explored the principles that should guide decisions on the role of the state. Albert's now building on that foundation to develop a new approach to the state, which he calls the precautionary state, one that moves from just-in-time systems to a just-in-case approach with ample provision of public goods. And I'm delighted to say that Albert joins me now to discuss the idea. Albert, welcome back to UCL Uncovering Politics. And let's start with the obvious question. What is the precautionary state and why do you think we need this concept? Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to talk about this idea, Alan. I'm very, very grateful indeed. Uh, And you you said in your uh, introduction that this is a new idea. And I think actually, uh, in terms of the sort of recent history of uh, government and uh, political ideology over, say, the last 40 years or so, um, it is a new idea. But in fact, actually, the earliest recorded example that I've come across of what I would think of as the precautionary state is something that you find in um, the book of Genesis, chapter uh, 41, uh, where Joseph, who, uh, via a rather circuitous route, which uh, which would take too long to go into, ends up interpreting the dreams of the pharaoh. And Pharaoh's had two dreams. He's had a dream that there were seven fat cows that walked out of the Nile, and then seven lean cows, and uh, the lean cows at the fat cows, and there were seven full ears of corn, and there were seven lean ears of corn, and the lean ears of corn, et, the, the fat ears of corn, the full ears of corn. And Pharaoh is puzzled by this dream. And uh, Joseph interprets it as being there, there as a prediction that there will be uh, seven years of plenty in the land and seven years of famine in the land. And he explains this to Pharaoh. Um, this turns out to be quite a, quite a quick route to major promotion, actually, in Joseph's life, because he ends up as the chief executive of Egypt uh, during this period. And basically uh, orders a system uh, by which one fifth of the grain in the good years uh, is set aside in order to be able to cover the grain in the in the bad years, the lack of grain in the bad years. This is highly successful, by the way, at least according to this this narrative, if we're to believe it, because um, it created a system in which people came from abroad to buy the grain that Egypt had stored up. Um, So this is, I think, um, a, a model, if you like, of the precautionary state. And it's a it's a model, I think, in three three respects. Uh, first of all, um, it's about state activity over time, and it's about the the fact that the state is the agent which is capable of planning for a society over time uh, and of dealing with uh, fluctuations in the fortunes of a society uh, over time. I suppose if one were looking in modern public policy terms. Uh, the most clear, the clearest example of this would be counter-cyclical economic policy. The idea that government should should spend uh, when demand in the economy is low and there would otherwise be unemployment, and that the government should build up a surplus uh, when the economy is doing doing well. So, we have, if you like, a, a modern example of this planning for fluctuations uh, over the course of time. Um, I think the second element of the precautionary state, which you mentioned in your introduction is that it's based on this idea of uh, putting resources aside just in case you need to be able to provide for an emergency, a famine or whatever. Um, And I I think um, 
if you think about the current NHS crisis, it's obviously a very complex phenomenon. But, but one element of that phenomenon is that if you look internationally, the UK uh, provision of hospital beds is very low. The ratio of beds per thousand population is, is, is very low and it's, it's actually been uh, declining uh, over time. Now, you can say, well, look, that's a very highly efficient use of resources. We're using up to 90 percent of our beds at any one time. But of course, when difficulties come along, uh, then that bed shortage really shows itself um, up. And there are some very interesting models that, that operations researchers have done, which have shown that you've only got to get small fluctuations, so to speak, in fortune before you start to get a really big uh, build up of uh, cases that cannot be accommodated. So, so I would say this just in time component is very important uh, and a central element of the precautionary state. And I think the third element of the precautionary state is that um, while markets are very powerful devices, uh, they're very good devices, for example, for using um, decentralized, dispersed information. They're very good at fostering different types of innovation uh, and so on. There are certain problems that markets alone can't deal with. They typically cannot, cannot deal with the uh, cumulative unintended consequences of individual behavior. Panic buying uh, would, would be uh, an example. So uh, I think the lesson we draw from that is a rather old one, actually, which is that uh, markets make good servants, but bad masters. Uh, and the precautionary state is there, if you like, to offset the deficiencies of markets. Uh, and in particular, this tendency, this, this inability of markets to deal with the cumulative unintended consequences of individual decision making. Fascinating. You've given us some hints there of the issues that prompted your thinking to go down this path. Do you want to develop that a little bit further? What were the the circumstances that you were reacting to in developing this idea oh that's a very uh, that's a very interesting question i think it was a, uh, i think it's a matter of a number of things coming together um firstly um i've always thought i mean it goes back a long way in my thinking about the welfare state that if we think about the welfare state if we think about things like um, sickness benefits pensions provision um, education and so on um, it's really important to think about that as dealing with the fluctuations over the life cycle. Um, I mean, essentially what is happening in a welfare state is that the working age population is paying to educate the next generation and is also paying to um, keep uh, retired people uh, with some income. So once we start to think about the welfare state, not, not as a means of redistributing income within a given year period, it does that, of course, but, but we should principally be thinking about the welfare state uh, as an instrument of redistributing resources over the life cycle. It's got this time dimension. And uh, Nick Barr, a very distinguished economist at the LSE, has a very nice uh, formula for this, which he says that, look, even if everybody were middle class, we would still need, need a welfare state because we would still need to deal with these fluctuations over the life cycle. Secondly, I think, um, I mean, I suppose, like everybody else, the 2008 financial crisis uh, was, I think, a, a wake-up call. Um, I mean, Gordon Brown, I think, with the best of intentions, said before the 2008 crisis that we'd learnt how to, to uh, avoid boom and bust. Uh, well, um, the 2008 crisis showed that we hadn't been able to do that. And again, there are many things to say about that crisis, but a very plausible view, I think, to say about that crisis is that um, the regulators and the policymakers became complacent um, they thought that markets could look after themselves, that if institutions fell, uh, then the liabilities would simply fall where they fell. And, and, and that was just a risk of the market, so to speak, and that the market was a self-correcting uh, mechanism. And I think, therefore, that the 2008 crisis re revealed that. Uh, thirdly, climate change, uh, the climate emergency. The Rio Declaration on uh, Environment and Sustainable Development took place in 19... 92. Uh, and as part of that uh, Rio process, uh, we also had the UN Framework Convention on uh, Climate Change. So just over 30 years ago. So we've had these, uh, we've had these international agreements in place. But since those international agreements in place uh, have been in place, um, CO2 emissions have actually increased by 60%. I mean, in other words, they've, got, they've gone up 
it's it's not that people have acted on that understanding, which we had way back in the 1980s. I, I mean, to, to give her her credit, I mean, Mrs. Thatcher saw this issue about climate change uh, back in the li- 1980s when she was prime minister, famously said to George Bush, look, George, I'm a scientist, I understand these things. Um, and so this failure to be able to act on anticipated problems uh, strikes me as being uh, very important. I mean, that's that's just like Joseph. Well, I mean, imagine what 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 the precautionary sceptics would have said to Joseph. You know, well, we don't know that these seventeen years are going to happen. How good are your how good are your estimates really? Are you really saying that uh, we've got to take um, a, a one fifth of the crop? Couldn't we just take uh, one tenth or something like that? So you can imagine that that you'd have sort of famine sceptics, and I think just as we have climate change sceptics, and uh, I think the failure to be able to act on these issues uh, has been very important uh, for me. And then finally, uh, and most obviously, I suppose, COVID. So the the public health system in the UK uh, before COVID came along had a very high reputation. Uh, in fact, there was a, a there's an international peer review of uh, public health systems around the world and the UK came very high in the various estimates of epidemic preparedness. Um, And there's absolutely no doubt, for example, that the modelling capacity for epidemics and epidemiology in this country is extremely, extremely good. Uh, Nonetheless, um, uh, there were failures in that. Um, Indeed, I remember saying to a student just after COVID broke out, he asked me, you know, how did I think things were going? I said, well, I think it's going to be pretty good in going to be pretty good in the UK. We've got a pretty good public health system. Um, And uh, I was clearly wrong uh, on that. Uh, That's again, that's a complex matter. And we have to wait for the Hallett inquiry into COVID-19 to establish, you know, precisely what the responsibilities uh, are for uh, the failures of government policy. But I think that I think there has been a failure of government policy. And in a way, uh, the government itself acknowledged a failure of policy when it abolished public health England. So I think I think just reflecting on these experiences of failures to deal with climate change, failure to anticipate the need for tighter regulation before uh, the 2008 uh, um, financial crisis, uh, the need to be able to deal with the unintended consequences of markets and what that means. Those have really been sort of shaping my thinking and and making me ask myself the questions about, well, what would we require of a state that was capable of dealing with these very difficult problems and was able to make uh, preparation for them of an adequate kind? So it's interesting there that there are several different types of risk, I think, that you're talking about there. So you're talking partly about kind of life cycle smoothing and dealing with the natural peaks and troughs uh, in, in, in a lifespan that exists. But you're also talking about the big kind of existential threats that might exist. So climate change, you've mentioned there, but presumably one could also talk about you know, the, uh, the the danger of a meteorite strike or the, the, the possibility that at some point AI takes over and, and, and controls the world. And, and these similarly, presumably, are, are, are things that one must plan for and take cautions against. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, and uh, I think that, um, I, I think what's common, you're, you're quite right, these are very different issues, but I think what's common to them is that um, as... As individuals, uh, as citizens, and I think as as governments, we find it very difficult to deal uh, with these with these problems. Um, I mean, it, the very good book by um, Lord Ricketts on hard choices, um, and he's primarily thinking about defence. But uh, he quotes somebody on pandemics, um, saying that um, pandemic preparation involves telling ministers what they don't want to hear asking them to spend money that they don't want to have for an event that they don't think will happen. Um, And I think that captures it very well. And if you think about all the things that could go wrong, I mean, there are many more things that could go wrong than actually do go wrong. And so it's an intrinsically difficult uh, issue to be to be able to think about uh, exactly how we should be prepared for these contingencies. Um, Having said that, uh, I would I would say two things Um, at, at the level of individuals. I do think that uh, individuals ought to be able to think through the implications of, for example, the need for social care. If you go back to the NHS crisis, a large part of that is about the inability to provide social care. Um, 
some 20 percent 25 percent of people in their 80s will have some experience of dementia it's an utterly predictable event it's an insurable event um, and yet there's been a political impossibility to devise adequate systems of social insurance in this country to be able to to be able to deal with that um, and at the collective level um, it's it's abundantly clear that uh, the pressure on water resources um, is going to become more serious rather than less serious i mean it may seem an odd thing to say in a winter when we all seem to be saturated with rain and the ground the ground is sodden and there are floods but the Envi environment agency has said that um, it's likely that we'll have the same sort of water shortages in 2023 as we had in 2022 uh, the national infrastructure commission has produced done some very good work on showing that the pressure on water resources particularly in the southeast of england is going to be there uh, for the next 30 years or so so it's true that there are lots of, if you like, remote events about which it's very hard to think in a system, systematic way about how we might prepare for those and what priority to give for those. That's, that's, that's true. But I think my point would be that there's, there's enough that we know about, there's enough that we can predict for us to be really needing to think about what a precautionary approach would involve, both to protect individuals for the utterly foreseeable risks that they incur as they get older and frailer and so on, uh, as well as, for example, um, the, the risks they face when, when younger. Uh, we know enough about those risks to be able to, to do something about them. And, and we often do things about them. We do design safety systems and so on. Um, it's just needing to take that, uh, that, pro that process further. And at the collective level, the level of water resources or climate change, uh, then I think, again, we know enough uh, about, the, to, about the need to plan and to think about those systematically. Before we go a little bit further into some of these practical implications, it would be good to explore the, the political theory aspect of this a little further. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that you've found precursors to this thinking in Genesis. Uh, how does this relate to the tradition of social contract theory that you explored uh, in such depth in your recent book? Well, this is... Um, uh, I'll, I'll try and restrain myself on this answer because this could this this probably takes a long time and there, and there is some uh, there, there is a there's, there's there's a fair amount of theory particularly theory of uh, rational choice uh, that's going on uh, at the background to this and it's particularly tied to the idea of uh, prudence and what it means to lead a prudent life so I'll just try and explain explain some of those ideas as as best uh, I can. So very common, but in my view, mistaken understanding of prudence is that it's just about being rational in the world. Um, it's about weighing up costs and benefits uh, and making uh, an accurate uh, calculation of those costs and benefits and acting so as to maximise uh, net, net benefit. It just reduces down to a certain sort of calculating uh, rationality. Now, I don't think that gives you prudence. And it doesn't give you prudence for one reason, uh, which is that there's nothing irrational about taking risks in life. I mean, there's nothing irrational in somebody, for example, who thinks they've got artistic talent, throwing up a safe job, living in a uh, uh, an attic for, for years and trying to produce paintings, which might not sell at all. There's nothing irrational about that. That's just a that's just a life plan that, that somebody has chosen. So um, it, it prudence it's it's imprudent, but I don't think it's irrational. I mean, it may turn out that it was the right thing to do if somebody turns out to be a superb selling artist, but somebody may end up starving in a garret, wishing that they'd stayed in their job in accountancy or a state state agency or whatever. So I think prudence has got has got something to do with the idea that we want to offset the risks, that we're prepared, if you like, to take less at the top end of the top end of, of a risk distribution uh, in order to protect us against uh, what's at the bottom end of a distribution. Now, that, I think, is what marks out prudence as a distinctive virtue. And indeed, the person who really, I think, identified this uh, above all was Adam Smith in the theory of the moral sentiments where he has a chapter on prudence and explains that the prudent person isn't just everybody when they're being rational it's a particular type of, of personality now my point is that if we're thinking about government 
we don't want our governments to play the roulette wheel uh, and risk risk what we know we can have for some speculative future. We want we want governments to handle our affairs wisely. Uh, that does not mean that they have to offset every risk, but we want them to have the prudence, for example, which we would expect trustees of a charitable trust to have, to manage the resources at their disposal uh, in a way that uh, they can account for them and say, well, a reasonable person under these circumstances trying to take stock of the facts, bearing in mind the obligations that the trustees have to the beneficiaries, a reasonable person would take these would take these judgments. So the the origin of the idea in 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 social contract theory, what this amounts to is something like the following: that uh, justice is generalized prudence. Justice is the way in which we would treat people as they would as we would want them to treat us on the assumption that we were being prudent in our relationships. So we cooperate with others in a prudent way. We're not, we don't just, we don't just give them resources and, and say, get on with it. We, we have terms and conditions of, of cooperation and so on. That's what the social contract uh, defines. And what underlies that is a concern for prudence, for creating a, creating a set of circumstances in which as individuals, we can then plan our lives uh, and undertake the activities that we need to undertake. Let's get into some practical implications then. You've you've talked quite a lot there about public health and indeed you're a co-author on a recent article in The Lancet on the public health system in the UK. So what do we get from the idea of the precautionary state about how the public health system ought to operate, what the state's responsibilities are in respect of public health and what that implies about how the, the, the system should be structured in the UK? Well, thank you for mentioning that article. And uh, it's it's been very interesting working with um, Peter Littlejohns and David Hunter uh, on, on this area, both both in many ways much more experienced in, in public health than, than I am. But I think I'd say uh, the following really in answer to your question. First of all, public health is a classic state responsibility. I mean, the state needs to be able to deal with infectious diseases. Uh, it needs to be able to deal with provision for extreme weather events. It needs to be able to deal with hazards that come along that threaten individual lives, which we can't deal with uh, as, as individuals or in, indeed even as uh, collections of communities. So it's a paradigmatic uh, state activity. However, um, it suffers a problem that I don't think is unique to this area, of, of uh, is unique as a matter of policy, but it is very distinctive, I think, of public health which is that it's very easy to be conscious of the costs of public health measures. I mean, think of lockdowns, for example. Very easy to be conscious of the costs of uh, public health measures. And but very hard to understand the benefits of public health measures, because when public health measures work well, what they do is they protect statistical lives. I mean, they protect all those people who would have had disease and injury, were it not for the fact that you had the public health measure in place, and we never see those. We never see those statistical lives. We never, we never see the counterfactual. Um, also, I think the other difficulty with public health is it's extremely wide field. I mean, it's typically divided into health protection, health promotion, and then health service quality improvement. I think the third in this context is is, is less relevant, but it's extremely wide. And so, uh, you're dealing, for example, with uh, infectious diseases. Uh, you're dealing with extreme uh, weather events. Uh, one of my favourites are the hazards of the processionary moth, um, the caterpillars of which drop down from trees and, and cause st- skin irritation on those sitting below. It's extremely wide field. You're trying to deal with uh, health improvement, which covers things like um, uh, diet, uh, alcohol intake, exercise, uh, and so on. And so you're covering a very wide field and determining the priorities and remits within that field is, is very difficult. And then thirdly, uh, you're dealing with one of these issues, which in governance terms is extremely difficult to deal with, namely that it necessarily involves a number of different government departments. I and mean, if you're thinking about public health measures, you may be talking about tax measures, for example, on alcohol, you may be talking about urban planning in terms of the need to deal with air pollution and 
designing urban transport systems that minimize pollution, devising ways of living in urban in urban scenes which allow for exercise, uh, for example. Uh, you may you may be dealing uh, with um, environmental uh, protection. I mean, think think of um, the issues over sewage discharge that we've had in this country for the last the last few months. All of these are public health related. And to be able to take effective action on public health requires governments to be able to work across departments of state. And we know that's difficult. I mean, that's just intrinsically difficult for uh, multi-agency organisations of, of any sort. Um, but I think it's particularly difficult for, for governments. Um, it involves delicate questions about interdepartmental responsibilities and coordination and so on. Um, it's very difficult for people to take the credit and so on. Then, on top of all that, and I think that this is not unique to the UK, but I think particularly acute in the UK, is you've got the demands of the National Health Service. Now, people have been saying for decades, look, the National Health Service is not really a health service, it's a sickness service, uh, which deals with people who are sick. It's, that's, its, that's its job. But the point about the National Health Service, particularly in a period in which um, public expenditure constraints have been very tight, and so the health service has been funding has been squeezed since 2010. The point about that is that the failures of the National Health Service are very visible. They're failures of people to be able to get appointments on time or to find a dentist or to be able to get uh, uh, appointments for, for surgery and so on in reasonable amounts of time. And so naturally, there's a political imperative for politicians to feel the need to deal with those health service problems. And that preempts resources going into the public health system. And I have to say, before I was doing this work with uh, with with Peter and and, and David and uh, and also with um, one of our former students actually at UCL, Jacqueline Johnson, and then somebody from KCL, Tosley McCartan. Um, I mean, I hadn't quite realised the squeeze on public resources going into public health until we until we actually looked at the numbers, and they are very very striking. If you look at the public expenditure since two thousand and thirteen on public health, it just goes um, steadily down. So. In some ways, it's not surprising that the public health system in the UK, when COVID came along in 2020, you know, was not capable really of rising to that challenge. So is the problem simply one of resources or is there also a difficulty in structures? I think there is a difficulty in structures. Um, and I think that's to do with uh, political priorities. Uh, I mean, there is supposed to be cabinet level coordination um, but the last evidence I've seen of this, which goes back to a BMJ piece in the beginning of November, uh, was that the relevant cabinet committee had not yet been established uh, under, the new, under the new prime minister. So I think there is a question about priorities at the top. And we know that driving public health measures forward requires high level decision makers to take, to take it seriously. We, we know that. Um, and then I think um, in the case of COVID, I think there was a genuine instance of groupthink, um, that the planners thought that they were going to be dealing with something like a serious flu epidemic. Uh, they didn't really understand the possibility of asymptomatic uh, a disease with asymptomatic transmission. Um, and they, there was a House of Commons committee looking at this. And I think there was a general acceptance that among the planners, there had been, a, there had been this sort of intellectual failure of groupthink, which was important. So all of these things come together. Resources come together. Political priorities come together. Um, the, mind, the mindset of, of uh, crucial administrative actors in the system uh, also comes together. Um, the difficulty, I think, is, is that no one of these things is offsetting the other. I mean, that is to say, it's, it's not as though there's enough resources going in that even if the high level decision makers don't have time because they're being preoccupied with something else, then nonetheless, the administrators can get on and they've got the resources to be able to think about it and so on. Um, uh, What's what's what what this requires, I think, is is this this combination of elements of clear thinking, of organisational um, relationships and cooperation, uh, and and of resources. And these problems are not new. Um, I mean, in 1976, the Labour government produced a document called Prevention and Health: uh, Everybody's Business. A few years later, the Canadian government had its Lalonde report in 2004. I think it was Derek Wanless. Uh, made the point about the need to deal with public health. And the reason this is important is that all of this is feeding into demand on the NHS. So uh, the 2014 five-year plan on the NHS 
made the point that 10% of NHS expenditure goes on diabetes. I, I didn't believe that when I first read it, actually. I had to go back to the original research to, to find it out. Well, diabetes is one of those things that, again, is, is complex, but it emerges from food systems, which, in, which encourage sugar intake and so on. And to deal with that, you need, a, you need public health uh, measures. Um, think about the demands on a and e that arise from alcohol related incidents on a friday and saturday night in this country again this is feeding into demand on the system and unless we start to deal with that question of demand we'll be constantly finding ourselves in this situation of patch and mend and crisis and emergency measures and so on in in the national health service at a time when we still haven't been able to think in this life cycle way about how to deal with social care and discharges from hospital. So you've got to think about this as a system. We should also think about counter arguments to your view. And I think one view that is widely held, particularly on the right of politics, is that the state isn't, uh, is not is already too risk averse. So it's not that it's um, insufficiently thinking about long term risks, but it's too risk averse. It's uh, too cautious, too over bureaucratized. There are too many rules and regulations and procedures and so on that are constraining the state from uh, from doing new and exciting things that will push the country along in a in a more positive direction. How would you respond to that kind of critique? Well, I think it, 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 it depends precisely what the, what the criticism is. Um, so I think it's certainly true that um, probably from the libertarian side, not exclusively from the libertarian side of politics, but from the libertarian side of politics, there is often a critique of the precautionary principle which says that this inhibits innovation. Uh, and I suppose there's the sort of poster child for that view is, is genetically modified crops. That's, that's the example that comes out. Uh, my own view, uh, and this comes this comes from some work on on water reuse that I've been been doing with a long-standing colleague, Robert Field, um, is that actually precaution can facilitate uh, innovation. Um, the reason why we why we why we sometimes need to accelerate the implementation of certain technologies is because unless we do so, we know there are going to be problems down the line. Unless we do something technologically really interesting about water use for example, we are going to find ourselves in 2030, 2040, really struggling with effective water supply. So so part of my answer is that uh, you can't generalise about the relationship between precaution and innovation um, across the board. It depends on the particular technologies and the particular issues that you're dealing with. Um, The second part of, of, of my answer, I think, is that there is a real difference. And this goes back to the theoretical points I was making about the fact that individuals can be imprudent without being irrational, um, and uh, but the fact that we need governments to be prudent, there's a difference between what we expect governments to do and what we allow individuals to do. Um, and when you come to, for example, infectious diseases, it's no use saying, well, look, there's an individual freedom for people to live their lives as they will, if that individual freedom has spillover effects on others. So so you need to be able to think about that. Interestingly, uh, and um, in in this book that uh, colleagues and I are working on this public health, we're we're planning a book that sort of emerges from the article that I mentioned before. Um, I I cite Hayek on this. So Hayek is extremely interesting. Um, He makes the point that um, it's quite right to compel people um, to contribute towards social security uh, if you're in a situation in which people, if they're poor, will require social security. Uh, He says, look, society will simply not turn away people who are poor. So those people, if you like, owe an obligation to contribute to the system. Um, And I think the same is true of um, public health measures. Uh, I mean, the NHS will simply not, it it will not close its doors to those who are thought to have had self-inflicted injuries. I mean, those, that gets very difficult to disentangle anyway, but but, it won't, it won't close its doors to those suffering from diabetes or sexually transmitted diseases or whatever. So there's a corresponding obligation, if you like, which only the state, I think, can facilitate to get people to, to be in a context in which they can think, 
about their own responsibilities and about the possible demands that they might be making on the wider society. I think that's a, you know, that's a point that Hayek quite correctly makes. I mean, Hayek is a you know, guru of a gu- guru of the libertarians, uh, but even Hayek is prepared to allow this. So I think that would be my my response: that precaution is not always uh, anti-innovation. Uh, we need to be able to deal with the uh, spillover effects, um, and uh, in in any case. Um, we need to be able to think about things collectively rather than just uh, individually. And is there also an idea here that people will be freer in their own lives to innovate and try new things if they know there is a robust safety net and the state needs to be cautious in order to ensure that it can be, can provide that safety net? I think so. I mean, I think it's a very, I think it's a very interesting question. In actually, in the bev- beverage, in in the famous report, Social Insurance and Allied Services discusses precisely this point. And he says, well, look, some people say that if you have social insurance, it's it's going to stop uh, risk taking and innovation and so on. And he says, well, look, Francis Drake was not stopped from risk taking um, because that, nonetheless he was economically secure. Um, and I think I think you're 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 right that the. And I think this is a central part of, of precaution, that, that what people need to be able to rely upon are robust systems in place that are going to protect them in case things go drastically wrong. For example, that they buy a house uh, that let, subsequently turns out to be a floodplain or prone to some other environmental hazard, radon, something like that, that's going to protect them in that case, but that also protects them from the untoward action of others. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I think that this, this collectivism at the level of the state and of state organisations is actually an expression of what I would think of as an ethical individualism. So I do think that the ultimate unit of value are individuals and their experiences and the quality of lives that they can lead and so on. Um, I don't think there's a supra individual entity called the state or the glory of the nation or whatever. That, that we ought to be pursuing. I mean, I think that is, I mean, that is a form of totalitarian democracy. If you if you try and say, well, look, individuals should should be subservient to some supra individual goal, I think that's that that is not the ethical theory that's, that's required. But the, what social contract theory tells you, and it's a sort of, you might think about it as a paradox, but I don't think it is a paradox if you reflect upon it. But what social contract theory tells you is that in order to protect individuality, and indiv- the value of individual experience and the value of individual lives, we need robust forms of collective organisation. I mean, that, you know, I've probably given this example before, but it's worthwhile giving again. I mean, that is the great lesson that comes out of Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes said, look, in a state of nature, life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. And what he meant by that was that you were prone in a state of nature to the depredations of other people. And so you needed some collective arrangement, some form of public authority, which was capable of regulating the relationships among individuals such that they could actually be freer uh, in their interactions. Um, And and so this is not anti-individualist in any way. Um, it's just that the paradox is that to be an individualist, you also need to be a collectivist. We're going to have to wrap up very soon. But one final question. If we agree that the precautionary state is a good idea, how do we get there? Um, and I guess I'm particularly thinking about how we reform our politics. You've talked about the fact that a lot of the activity of a well-functioning precautionary state is focusing on the long term whereas politicians famously have a tendency to focus on the short term. How can we overcome that? How can we get the state to think about these issues that might come along at some point in the future, but long beyond the time when a given politician is, has left office? So I think it's terribly easy to get pessimistic about this. Um, and I don't, I don't want to be pessimistic about this. And I, uh, one of the things I want to say in answer to that sort of question is, Let's think about the variability of state performance. Uh, I mean, I've, I've, if you like, been talking generally about the difficulty that states have in organising things and so on. But I think that um, some parts of, our, of the UK state uh, actually work really quite well 
um, in a precautionary way. I mean, I think the work that the National Audit Office does is very good in terms of reporting back to Parliament um, how well implementation has gone. It actually had a very interesting chapter on public health in its uh, uh, recent uh, recent discussion of, of health service reform. So I think we can look to bodies like that. I think we can look to the National Infrastructure Commission. I have been critical about particular pieces of work, but I think the National Infrastructure Commission um, you know, is a, is a good organisation. I think that uh, we look to bodies like the Bank of England. I think we look to parliamentary committees, uh, many of which I think are very conscious of, of uh, these issues. Um, I think actually devolution is an interesting opportunity here. I mean, I think one of the things that when we think about public policy in the UK, and this is not a point original to me, others have made it, but I mean, I think we haven't really exploited the fact that uh, the, the home nations have had different policies and we ought to be able to learn from those. So minimum unit pricing for alcohol has come in in Scotland. Um, it's been resisted uh, in, in England. Well, we, we ought to think about that and think about the Scottish experience and see whether you know it's led to the sort of awkward consequences that people opposed to minimum unit pricing in England thought it would do, or whether in fact it's been beneficial in terms of public health. So I think we can we can exploit those, we can exploit those variations. Finally, um, I mean, I suppose you would expect me to say this as a political theorist, wouldn't you? But um, finally, I think it's very important that we think clearly about this. And I think thinking clearly really requires us to have a system of public information and public communication that is strongly fact based, that can distinguish between questions of value and questions of fact. Uh, that maintains uh, a robust evidence base in terms of what we uh, of, of the important issues that are facing us, that can handle uncertainties and, and disagreements in a sort of adult, civilized way, rather than make rather than turning them into to partisan advantage uh, and so on. And so I think that we need to pay attention to those those systems of communication. But I'm not, I, I'm I'm not wholly pessimistic about this. I mean, I don't want to fall into this mode of pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. I mean, I think I think we, could, we, we ought to have some optimism of the intellect, provided that we're prepared to think clearly about this. Um, and all, all one can do as an academic, I think, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, um, is you can do what, what academics do, which is they scribble away, um, they talk away endlessly, um, and um, they try and um, persuade people of the value of ideas. And I think if, if they're doing their job well, um, they take on board the criticisms and try and reflect and think about them. Well, you've been a model of clear thinking here, as always, Albert. And uh, it's great to finish on a positive, optimistic note as well. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been fascinating. I've got lots more questions that I would want to ask, but uh, we'll have to have you on again when the book on public health comes out. So thank you, Albert. And full details of Albert's Lancet article and also a blog post in which he develops the idea of the precautionary state are available in the show notes for this episode. Next week, we'll have a very special guest, a leader of a UK political party, no less. I won't say more than that for now, but do look out for information about about that episode in the coming days. Remember to make sure you don't miss out on that or other future episodes of UCL Uncovering Politics. All you need to do is subscribe. You can do so on Apple, Google Podcasts, or whatever podcast provider you use. And while you're there, we'd love it if you could take a moment of time to rate or review us as well. I'm Alan Rennick. This episode was produced by Connor Kelly and Eleanor Kingwell Benham. Our theme music is written and performed by John Mann. This has been UCL Uncovering Politics. Thank you for listening. Thank you.